Hi, this is Jay. Welcome to my channel. As many of you may know, I'm through hiking the Appalachian Trail in 2022 and I published a gear video just earlier in the week. And now it's time to go more in depth on all the little categories of gear, just so I can tell you why exactly I chose them. And I didn't want to do it in the first video because I think it's going to be, I don't know, I put a lot of thought into things. So it could be like 90 minutes long. So if you wanted to know about my food and water decisions, this is the video for you, so come back after the intro. I did want to break it up into categories because I figure some people might be interested in the food, some people might be interested in the big three, but maybe they're not interested in all of them, so they could see all my gear and then see the more in-depth videos if you're interested in that category of item. like. Maybe some people want to know about the big three, but not the clothes and things like that. So let's get started. First off is my pot. It's a Toke 750 milliliter titanium pot. I've had this since 2014. It's been on quite a lot of adventures, almost every one, except the first 700 miles of the PCT. I cold soaked and ate a lot of wraps on that one. But the reason I chose this one instead of a smaller one, um, a lot of people have been choosing smaller ones because they're just smaller and lighter and they just boil water, which is true. I originally chose a 750 milliliter because I can cook a whole ramen in there and it doesn't overflow. But on trail, I like to boil at least two cups of water, which comes to about this mark on the cup. And there, there are no marks in this cup. The new ones have marks, but this is an older one. But I like to boil about that much and a little more. So if a mountain house or even a ramen or a nor side says boil two cups, I'll add extra water. The reason is I like to put in extra couscous or instant white rice to it to give it more calories. And I find a lot of the meals are too salty. So I like to add those things and it kind of evens it all out. But the rice and couscous will of course absorb a lot of water. So you'll need more water but I also like my trail dinners a little soupier. I don't like them too thick because it kind of, it doesn't go down as easily. I mean, sure, I'm going to add like a tablespoon of butter <laughs> to each meal. But if you add a little more water or a tablespoon of butter, it helps just things go down. If you're just not feeling it and you just can't, you're just forcing yourself down. If you water it down, for me, I love soups and stews and like pho, I love things like that. It's hydrating and it's just easier to eat. So I went with the Toke 750 milliliter. It is 4.2 ounces and I'll show you the grams on the, in the corner here, but it's my go-to mug. So 750 milliliter Toke's titanium. Next up is my spoon. It's a Toke's titanium long handle with the shiny head. Um, I thought I would prefer the shiny head more than the, the other one that's the same material, but the other one almost feels the same. So I think like Tina has a normal one that feels the same, but I don't know. I, I still like the idea of polish because it's just smoother, but you always need a long handle if you're going to do freezer bag cooking because so here's a freezer bag. This is normally what I'll be cooking food in. You want a spoon that can go all the way down and not get your fingers all dirty. The better you keep your fingers clean, the less you have to clean it and you don't have any food smell in your hands. So it's just the way to go. Plus, if you reach into your bag like this and you have a shorter spoon, it just, you get it all over your hands. Plus, I am a firm believer in cleaning everything out when I eat. When I freeze your back cook, I prefer a spoon over a spork because I go along the sides and I scrape off every last drop. You won't see any solids in there, nothing like that. There might be a little oil on the sides because you can't get everything. But I, I especially like this spoon because it's kind of flatter on the top. It's got a slight curve, but it's mostly flat. And you can just drag it along the bag and just scrape every little drop of food. If you're going to carry the food, might as well eat all of it. And if you don't clean out your bag completely, that's trash you're carrying with you. So that's, there's no sense in that. Just eat it all, get it in your body so you can burn it off. 
your back should be like almost this clean when you're done eating. Uh, maybe not necessarily, but you want it as clean as you can. So I prefer the spoon over the spork. Also, I found if you cook with your pot, um, one of the best ways to clean it is initially take a spoon and just kind of rub it to get all the food off with some water. And with a spork, you just can't do that as well. It's not nearly as efficient as a spoon. I've tried a spoon or a spork before and I did not like it. So I've gone to spoon and never turned back. So there it is. This is 0.75 ounces, not heavy at all. And just be careful with it. Anytime you take a break or eat lunch, when you get up, look at where you were sitting and around that area and just double check before you take off. I have found one of these spoons before on trail on the PCT and I had record pace running ahead trying to catch whomever had left the spoon, but I never did find a person, but I found someone who else who also lost a spoon, so I gave it to her, but be careful with that. Now the canisters I would prefer are the four ounce canisters. Uh, Jet Fuel makes a good one. I like MSR the most. I always keep this cap and I'll show you why, but the isobutane propane mixes are the way to go. If you look at all of them, they'll say what kind of mix they have. I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but the, some of the cheaper ones will have butane propane mixes. And the problem with that was butane stops evaporating basically. Well, it stays a liquid at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Once that happens, only the propane will actually gas off and your stove will burn just propane. And the butane will just sit there. So uh, if you're in constant cold temperatures, you may feel some weight, but not working at all because propane's all gone. Isobutane will work down to 11 degrees Fahrenheit. So there's that. And propane works down to negative 44 Fahrenheit. So it'll work really well. This should work down to 11 degrees Fahrenheit pretty well. Uh, the pressure will drop, of course, as it gets colder, but I have a solution for that. Now, some people may be wondering like, why don't they make propane tanks like this so we don't have to worry about the temperature? It's because the pressure for propane is so much greater than isobutane or butane that if you only put propane in a canister like this, it's gonna be, it's gonna have to be made of thicker steel. Like this is already steel. And if you just do propane, it's gonna be a lot thicker steel and a lot heavier and just a lot more material. So it's, it's a good compromise, I think what they did. And isobutane is actually pretty nice. 11 Fahrenheit is a good way to go. But I prefer small ones because it fits in my pot. The big ones though, I mean, someone asked this on Facebook earlier or on a YouTube video earlier, but whatever canisters you can find, you take. Um, if it's gonna work with your stove, you buy it. You can't be picky because sometimes it's just, you're just lucky to get one at all. So four ounces is what I'll bring in initially once I get to REI. And the stove to go with that is the MSR Pocket Rocket Deluxe. It is a lot heavier than a BRS stove. I have taken a BRS stove on other trips. I used that on the Arizona Trail the whole way and it worked great, but I know that I think a lot of times it's gonna be below freezing on the trail at night. So I wanted something that has a compensated system. So even when it gets down really cold, the pressure, the amount of gas coming out of the stove will be consistent the entire time. It's nice because I don't know how many of you used maybe canisters that were a third empty and it's relatively cold. You put it on and you crank it up and it works great, but then you step away and come back or you look away and come back and you'll see the flame went down. Because uh, as gas evaporates off this, it actually gets colder and as it gets colder, the pressure decreases and the amount of the size of your flame will be a lot smaller. So instead of boiling water, you're sitting there just kind of heating it up. So I like having this option just because it'd be a more consistent burn. And I have found that this is very windproof as well as works really well in boiling water. And in other reviews I have seen, it does an excellent job boiling water. It's mostly because I wanted the regulator that's on here to just control everything. I don't know if you've ever used a regulated stove before, but the, the nozzle is very different. It's smooth throughout and it spins a lot. You have a lot of control. So if you want to simmer food, I think this stove may be, be the best way to go because you have so much control 
Whereas if you turn it just a little some, in some stoves, it fluctuates so much and it's smooth, really light and smooth. Like there's no way you're gonna knock over your stove trying to adjust it, so. Remember folks, after you're done, you may have to turn a little to the left to close it. But before you screw it onto your canister, always close the valve. Otherwise, you're gonna have fuel just shooting out of the top and always try to keep your canister upright. There might be a little spurt of gas in the beginning. If you do this, you might actually get some liquid shooting out. So keep it vertical and then uh, and that's it. Yeah, here's how I attach canisters. Um, this stove, let's see. Still relatively new to it. So this stove, you can tighten it up. I like to just put it on, spin it a little bit, make sure it has a grip. And once you do that, I like to just do it as fast as you can. Do not hesitate, because if it starts leaking and you're hesitating, it'll just keep shooting out. Just go as fast as you can. And this one didn't leak at all. Excellent stove. It's a heavy stove at three ounces and it is expensive. I think it was like $65. Uh, I got it at REI when they had the 20% off coupon deal at the, at the moment, but really nice. It's heavy, but uh, it works really well. So I'm sticking with this choice. I'm pretty sure until it gets warmer, maybe I'll switch to BRS, who knows. But to take it off, I loosen it and I just go spin it really fast. No hesitation. You got to commit to it being on or commit to it being off. And that's it. So that's the stove I'll be bringing. It's uh, not too many people are going to bring it because it's heavy, but I'll consider it part of the winter gear problem. And uh, someday I'll learn how to close it correctly. <laughs> there you go. So that's what I am bringing. I also have a Bic lighter, a mini Bic lighter. I'll grab one from the car. I guess I'll fly with that. To put everything in the pot, I always just start with a piece of paper towel. I get a big piece. Um, if you get the double ones, I like to get two because you could work with one, but I like to get two in case you need half or something. You just toss it over. And these fuel canisters are made of steel, so they will rust when wet. So this one actually has a little bit of rust on the bottom. And some people complain about rust on the bottom of their pots, and it's because they put their canister in like this. A lot of times when you wash your pot, you can't get it completely dry unless you use something to wipe it. And nobody does that really because you don't have garbage, really. you create extra garbage. And they just put the canister in there and that just gets wet. What I do is I keep the lid on on these and I put the paper towel over it and I actually just put it upside down like this and just shove it in. This will prevent rust getting on it and also the paper towel will pad the sides so the canister won't shake while you're hiking. So if you do this with nothing, this is what you're gonna hear. Every step, not fun. So I just do that, shove it down, get the stove, lighter and put it on top. Now, <laughs> as you can see, this stove is a lot bigger than the ones I've used. So it doesn't quite, quite fit level inside this pot. So the lid doesn't close. That's just the way I do it though. I, I just do this and I stuff it in my pack. It's always next to something. So the lid tend to not fall, or fall off much. And a lot of times I get in my pot or a lot of times I'll get in my backpack and the lid is somewhere else, but I don't mind, no big deal. But this is how I carry it. And if you got everything packed in, this is what you hear. Cause I have paper towel. So every time you go to a hostel or somewhere where they have paper towel, I recommend replacing the paper towel you have. I will admit on the PCT, I got my pot mailed to me at around mile 700 at Kennedy Meadows and I didn't replace that paper towel until Ash Bowl, which was maybe about 1,650 miles. So I went 950 miles of the same gross paper towel, but that's how I do that. The cooking style I'll be using is the freezer bag cooking, like I mentioned, and I'll be using the Hyperlite Repack. It's just a insulated little cozy. Um, this little clip things, all right. Um, a lot of people make their own with Reflectix, but I don't know how much you've worked with Reflectix and used it for a long time, 
but the silver part wears off really quickly. You're going to get silver stuff all over. And as the silver stuff comes off, it's not nearly as effective. And the silver tape you use also peels off. It's not the most durable. And this, I, I will say it's quite expensive. It, it was tough to give it a shot, but it works super well. I, I have to admit, freezer bag fits in there really nicely. So where's my freezer bag? Ah, yeah, so freezer bag works in there nice, really nicely. Just shove it in there. And then do everything you need to do and then close it up. And I like to just keep it straight because freezer bags aren't 100% waterproof and you want to risk food smelling water getting everywhere. So I usually lean it on something. It's actually pretty nice to warm up with because it does, I mean, this does a great job insulating, but it does get slightly warm. So if you hold it, it's pretty nice. And if you sit, it's nice to put it in between your legs. One thing with freezer bag cooking I don't like to do is wait until the water is just rolling, boiling. I think it's a little too hot. You can feel the bag get a little softer when you do that. And I think Hyperlite even recommends pouring the water in here just before it gets full on boiling because it's a little too hot for this plastic. And I found the hefty freezer bags are the best durable, thickest bags. They're a little heavier, of course, than like the Ziploc brand freezer bags, but go freezer bag. The storage bags are much thinner. So if you put in boiling water, there's more of a chance it's going to melt something or rip because the plastic gets really soft and then anything you do might rip it. So I have seen someone on Glacier National Park using storage bags and his bag rip. So yeah, hefty freezer bags. I think that's my go-to. And if you eat mountain house meals, instead of taking the whole bag with you, just open those mountain house bags and just pour it in here. Um, you may have to write on there how much water you're supposed to add because uh, it's different per meal, but you put it in here and it's so much smaller than the mountain house. It's smaller to pack out and there's less garbage to pack out or in, depending on which one is in for you. But yeah, so the mountain houses work fine. You can open the bags and they can sit in the air for a few days and that's no problem. So pour all your mountain houses and other like freeze dried meals into a freezer bag and go that way. Um, some people don't like using freezer bags because they create a lot of garbage, but it's basically one bag a day. So five nights is five bags. And I like to use each one for garbage. So in fact, when I get on trail immediately, I prefer to have two pieces of garbage or two bags for garbage. So I'll have one extra one. And the second one is for used toiletries, like basically used toilet paper. I shove it in there. So I use at least two, two bags for garbage per trip. So if you're going on three nights, you have three bags of garbage right there each night. So I don't mind using this. It's definitely saves you the time of cleaning your pot. And honestly, the pot is way too small for how much I eat. I would need well over a liter size pot, maybe a liter, I guess cause that's a quart, <laughs> but I would need way more than the pot can actually hold to feed me. Or if I did eat with this, I'd have to eat with it twice, which no fun. So freezer bag is the way I like to go. So that's what it is. The Hyperlite Repack weighs 1.4 ounces, so pretty light. And again, I've used it in the Arizona Trail, I believe 34 times and still perfect condition. None, none of the seams are off. There's no wear. It's a good way to go. For all my food, I will have a Z-Pax food bag, just like everybody else has. Uh, I do have some reflective tape I'm going to put on it in a weird pattern just so I can distinguish it that's mine. But yeah, I've used one for every trip I've had so far. So this will be with me. I do like to, I tie a little piece of bank line on this corner. And that way, a long time ago, I don't know if you know Nimor, uh, he used to, he hiked the AT quite a while ago. I watch a lot of vlogs. He said his one complaint was that when the bag is weighed down quite a bit, that this can slip. And it feels pretty sturdy, but when it's below freezing, you don't know how plastics are going to act sometimes. So I like to tie this little cord here 
The bag does come with this little carabiner. So if you pry a little cord here, you can actually clip it on. So in the advent, you hang your food bag and the plastic breaks for whatever reason, the cord and the carabiner will hold it closed and it won't fall. Uh, of course, the rope is usually held like this. So if the carabiner broke, you're in trouble, but this will be a good backup. And I think, I don't know, it's nothing in weight. It doesn't register on the scales. So it's worth it, I think, just to have a little backup because I don't want my food to fall somewhere. Now, yes, I have this. But I don't have a bear line. I won't bring one. Not because I'll be sleeping with my food. It's because I'm only planning on using this when I get to campsites where they have pulleys or other systems to pull your bag up, um, like all the national parks. I believe a lot of the shelter areas have it. I'll try avoiding sleeping in a shelter, but I may sleep around it and utilize their privies and their bear hang system. So this will be for when I need to hang my bear bag or this bag in those situations. And it is waterproof, so I don't want to use any kind of liners or anything like that. So that will be with me. The weight of this is 1.5 ounces, pretty light. And then the doozy. This here is the Ursac Almighty. Now, if you've been looking at it online recently, none of them look like this because they're all black. Uh, and I'm not sure why they made it black, I guess to hide better. But I prefer it white because if it's really sunny at some point, the food won't get hot. So the other bad point uh, of a white one is see all these little brown marks here. <laughs> uh, that's not dirt, it's mouse poop. I try to clean off as well as I can, but this fabric, it abs like really absorbs water. It's all really, it's tightly woven, but it's, uh, yeah. And up here, um, I try, I, wa I washed it really well. Oh, you can't see it as much anymore, but there was a ton of mouse poop all around the top. Inside of this bag, uh, I already, I was practicing nodding for the Ursac Almighty, but Inside of this bag is a Velcro strip, and it's really strong. And that's the food bag in there. This is critter as well as bear resistant. So it should be fine against mice, raccoons, fishers, martens, things like that, and bears. And I, I you're supposed to tie it like way away from your tent. Um, some reviewers have said that bears can get into it. So my, I'm going to tie it somewhere where I can see it for my tent. That way, if any bears start going at it, if it's going to get destroyed and they're going to get all my food, I'm going to get some good footage of that. <laughs> but if a bear tries to get to it and doesn't destroy my food, I'll get good footage of that too. But uh, I might tie uh, my cup near it, my mug near it. That way, if it rattles, it might make some more noise. So I'll wake up and I'll start filming because... That would be awesome to see. I'd love to see a bear interacting with things like that. But he shouldn't get to it. Um, the point, I think with this bag, I have a Z-Pax odor bag in here. It's not a zip bag. It just, you stuff it in there and tie it up. But I didn't use Optax because Tina used an Optax last year. And I've heard numerous, numerous complaints where they just break so quickly. They're expensive. And then they break so quickly that... They, I, for me, it's not worth it. So I put this in there. The reason that I am primarily using this is not really for the odor, partly odor, but this bag is not waterproof. Um, it will absorb through. There is no weird catch. I kind of wish you can hang it upside down. That way the rain doesn't just pour into the neck area. So it's not waterproof, so it can get in here. It's, I had to really think about this one, but the Ursac, I mean, I watch a lot of vlogs, like I've said, and the people that hung their food, they were very unhappy with having to try to find branches to hang it. And many of them have lost many bear ropes trying to get it down or hanging. So I didn't want to deal with any of that. I don't like to toss stuff. And first you got to find a branch and you got to toss it. And then you, it's a bit of work. And then you forgot something and you you know you have to lower it down and get back up kind of a pain so i'm just going to tie this into a tree 
should work. Uh, I just have to find trees that are not too big and about chest to head high. That's about how you want to hang it. I, I have a theory that a lot of people that had the ursacs broken into, they hang it too low. And when it's too low, a bear can bite it and use his paws to really pull at it. And their website says not to do that. So if you tie it higher up, they'll have to grab it and it's, they'll have to pull down as well. So it's a little harder for them to rip it open than at a much lower level. So that's that. The other disadvantage, like I said, is this thing will absorb rain like crazy. Uh, you did use it on the Wonderland Trail and that's where all the poop came from. And uh, I had to empty all the food out of it in the morning and just shake it and like spin it in circles real fast and try to shake off as much water as I could because it was kind of heavy. So my plan is in the morning, I will take all the food out, put it back in this bag and put it in my backpack. And this I will roll up if I can like that. It's super stiff. And then I'll put it inside of my backpack and just let it drain because it's... It's going to be wet for quite a while. It does a great job soaking up the water. Maybe Ursac made them all black because it dries quicker then. I don't know. But you have to go to the, their website and watch the knot. I'll have to show you. So you take this, go around the tree, and on the other side, you'll have it with you. So what you do is you loop it, go around, and then come back up. And it makes like a figure eight symbol there. And that is their preferred lock because it is what's called non-jamming. It means that if something pulls at it like this as hard as you could, it'll still be easy to untie. You definitely don't want a jamming knot because if that happens, you can't untie it. And then you're going to have to just cut it to get your food out. And then as soon as you cut it, your cord's shorter and it'll just be harder and harder to tie it. So go to their website and learn their knot. And this is not as heavy as a bear canister but it's 12.85 ounces. I have not measured it when it's soaking full of water, but I'm sure it's gonna be about a pound when it gets that heavy, so. And it's really stiff, I mean, look at that. Crazy, huh? But that's what I'm gonna bring. I think it's worth it. Yeah, on the Arizona Trail, there really weren't bears except for a couple of spots. And there were some rodents, but I always kept it away from the walls of my tent, the food bag. And I never had any problems on the PCT. I only hung the food bag when the areas where there were bear problems, like problem bears. They were like really asso like human associating humans with food. But on the Appalachian Trail, I think there are going to be a lot more problem bears out there. So I think it's smarter to take care of, a few, of your food. And I do use Ziploc bags and I portion out a lot of different meals. So if one of their bags or two of the bags get ripped, it's not so bad. I don't really carry liquids in there because I don't use peanut butter or things like that. So it shouldn't be too bad. Um, the only problem, I guess, if they squish my butter and it's going to get all over the place. <laughs> but that would be in a Ziploc bag as well. So everything's in little individual Ziploc bags. Now on to water. What system am I using? What filter am I using? Am I going to use chemical or UV? Well, I'm going to go with the Aquamira drops. I'll keep them in little Ziploc bags. And if you don't know already, these are a two-part chemical compound. One is the main part, uh, I forget, A, I believe, and then B is the activator. So in the morning, what I would plan to do, well, in use, you have to, when you get to a water source, they give you this little cup, and you're supposed to put seven drops of this, seven drops of this, shake it, and then wait five minutes for it to activate. And it changes this bright yellow color. Then you pour it in the water and you have to shake it. And then that's five more minutes you have to wait. So that's a long time. So I learned about this, um, I forget what year, but I saw early riser using it as well later. But in the mornings, you just take the two and I wish I had a smaller dropper. This one's as big as these two. But you drop like 50 drops, 50 drops, and mix it. And then you just carry this all day. You can put this away and you just carry this all day. And when you get to a water source, it's already ready. The five minutes are up. And one day isn't going to make the chemical less 
strong, it's going to work fine. So um, the one catch is the droppers are going to change the size of the dropper, so the surface area. So the drops may be a little smaller or bigger. So you have to figure out how many drops to put in. I did conduct a test. It didn't work out. So I got to do it again, and I have to buy another set because I think I'm going to go through a lot of it trying to figure out how many drops we'll need. I'll need all this because 7 and 7 might not be 14 out of this. It might be like 16 or 20. So I'll have to find out. But yeah, you pre-mix it in the morning, however much you're going to think you need for the whole day. And then when you get to the water source, you get your water. I will have coffee filters on me. I don't have any here. And I'll just use little patches and just hold it over the top as it fills with water just to get all the sediments out. And then you just put however many drops is equal to 14 total drops. And then you uh, wait five minutes and then it's ready to go. The one thing too is when you have a water bottle, after you pour in, imagine this is my water bottle, after you pour in all the water, tighten it, shake it so you get all that solution spread out, open the lid a little bit, and then shake it a little and then close it so enough water splashes into the whole mouth area. That way all that will be sanitized as well. So, Because if you're holding the water under a dirty water source, you're getting the dirty water all over. So that'll help clean off the neck area. That way you're not kissing germs, basically. In fact, when I opened this, it smells super bleachy because of the test. When you pour it in water, all that bleach smell is supposed to go away. So no worries. Big thing is when it's cold, you have to wait 30 minutes after you pour it in. So for me, pretty much every day, <laughs> most days I think, I'm going to have to wait 30 minutes. Uh, it's kind of hard because then you can't camel up at a water source. But on the AT, there's so many water sources that I shouldn't have to worry about cameling up at all. Except before a big climb or something. So that'll work well. The other advantage of these two is it kills everything, really. So, whereas the filters don't filter out viruses uh, and it's super tiny bacteria, but um, these will kill all the viruses. So, if there's anything in the water like Giardia or norovirus, norovirus is the bad one, um, or COVID could survive in the water for a little bit, maybe. I don't know. But norovirus is a big one. And um, I'll be ahead of the bubble because I'm starting. January 28th, actually, um, but this should do the job. That's my thing. The only problem, too, also is I'll have to figure out how to get more later on trail. I might have to buy more and have my sister mail it to me. Not sure, but that'll be my water filtration system. With two smart water or life water, they're all the same, um, two, bottle, two bottles like that. So that's that. Um, the other reason I'm using the Aquamira it's because I used a squeeze on AZT and I slept with it all but maybe just a couple of nights because it was right at or below freezing. And you just kind of get sick of sleeping with all this stuff. Like in the beginning, you'll sleep off all your batteries and your water filter and your phone. And you just get sick of it. And the batteries are heavy. They're cold. So oftentimes, I'll just be leaving them outside. Just not that one. Um, and you could potentially forget to sleep with your filter. The Aquamiras will freeze on you and then it won't work so much because it's all frozen. But uh, you could thaw it out in your pocket during the day. And once it thaws, it's still effective. Nothing changes. So that's a big bonus with that. The winter won't basically destroy it. So you just have to thaw it out so you can still make drops out of it. Along with that, I'll have a ever new soft bottle. I don't know if you've seen these before, but it's basically a little plastic bag. These things are only one and a half ounces, super light. I always kept one with me on the Arizona trail just as a extra backup water source. Um, it's nice having extra capacity for storage in case there is a dry section. You never know, but this can also work with Aquamira. You just fill it with water and you put double the amount of the drops in there and it should work. The I have found from experience that I could fill this mostly with water, not all the way, maybe maybe over here, but uh, you can have this actually freeze completely and it doesn't burst or leak, which is quite amazing. I thought for sure it would blow up on me, but 
yeah, that happened to me. The problem is when it freezes up completely, it takes hours for it to melt. And then you wind up carrying ice for no reason. You can't drink it or anything. But I like this one because it has a little elastic here as well. And then you can just tie it up. And uh, it's a little bulky, really. But uh, most of the time I just shove it into the bottom of my pack and I never notice it. Um, I always have trouble finding it because it's running around down there somewhere. The corners are a little sharp feeling. So you have to be not really careful. Like these corners are rounded, so it's not too bad. It's just when it's folded. But I think having something like this is a great backup just to have the capacity. You never know once you're out there, you left town already and you find that there's a water source dry coming up after a certain one and you wish you had more capacity. And this is easy way to double your capacity to two, four liters if you don't have two smart water bottles. So, plus if you are dry camping, it's always nice to have extra water. I don't know how often you'd be dry camping on the AT, but on the Arizona trail, it was almost every night. <laughs> And that's it really. That's my food and water and all the reasons I am choosing them. And the weights, I'll have my lighter pack down below in the description. The, uh, if you click in the lighter pack, you can actually change the weight and see it all in grams. I'll have all the weights here as well, but yeah, you can go into the lighter pack and change all the grams and you could see it. And that's, that's it for the show. So coming up next week sometime, we'll have the electronics which will be a huge video as well. And then we'll have a video on the big three items. I do have to go set my tent up in the snow. It's really cold outside. And clothing. And another video just for miscellaneous items that are not covered in all those videos. So come back for more. Um, for all of you who have subscribed for like car life type stuff, this might not be for you. But I believe like car life and backpacking, I think go together really well. It just, you have to backpack sometimes to go see some of the things out there just because it's worth it. It's rewarding because you have to work at it and less people get to see it. So if you're new to backpacking, I hope this kind of list helps out in some way or another. But for all you AT people, that's what I'm bringing. And uh, to each their own, right? Um, I will maybe switch to a Sawyer squeeze filter once when it's warmer. There's a lot of people using the B free as well as the instead of the squeeze. And I use the B free for, I don't know, maybe 800 miles on the PCT. And I will say the Sawyer squeeze, you can back flush pretty easily and it does a great job back flushing. I have recorded several back flushes on the Arizona Trail and you could see how much gunk comes out but on a bee free there's no back flushing you gotta like pour some fresh water and shake it or they say one of the ways is to stick it in the water and shake it or put it on a bag with dirty water and shake it but the shaking does not get it out and after the 900 miles or so it it turned it was so bad my hands are always so tired and i just couldn't keep up with anyone else filtering too that it's as it i uh, i did not like it at all but with the squeeze, you can tap it a whole bunch of times and back flush it and it always worked just like new and you could gravity filter with it. So my preference is a squeeze. So if I switch to the filter, it'll be a squeeze again. But come back next week for the other videos. Again, it's electronics, clothes, big three, as well as miscellaneous items. Till then, I'll talk to you later and you have a nice day.